Faith Hedgepeth would have been the first person in her family to graduate from college, an honor student in high school. She excelled in her studies and earned a Gates Millennium Scholarship to attend the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She had a passion for helping children and hoped to one day become a pediatrician. But that dream came to a tragic end when the UNC Chapel Hill Jr. was bludgeoned to death in the early morning hours of September 7, 2012, just weeks before her 20th birthday. A member of the Haliwa Saponi Native American tribe, Faith was born to Roland and Connie Hedgepeth on September 26, 1992, in Warren County, North Carolina, which is part of the tribe's traditional territory. She grew up in Hollister, a small town on the Warren-Halifax County border. Roland Hedgepeth described Faith as true joy. She was a gift because she came to us at a low point in my life. She kept me going. She was my Faith. Only a couple of months after Faith was born, her parents divorced and her father moved to Hickory, North Carolina, about a four-hour drive away. Faith kept in close contact with her father, but lived with her mother, Connie, and her older sister, Rolanda Hedgepeth, who helped raise her. Rolanda, who was 18 when her sister was born, was like a second mother to Faith, she said. I helped take care of her from the beginning. Everywhere we went, people thought she was my child, and she was. I felt like she was my child. Faith excelled in high school, where she was an honor student, a cheerleader, and a member of many extracurricular clubs and organizations. A Carolina girl to the core when it came time to apply for college. Faith knew she wanted to go to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She even earned the highly selective Gates Millennium Scholarship to attend the prestigious university. Her father had also attended UNC Chapel Hill, but never finished after starting a family with Connie. She knew exactly where she wanted to go, Roland said. She was a Carolina girl, and she was determined to go to school at Chapel Hill. As Faith began her third year at UNC, she was planning to further her studies and become a pediatrician Faith's mother, Connie said, all she wanted to do was help people, especially children. It was her passion, but school was hard. And when she started to struggle, she told me she thought about being a teacher instead. I told her the world is wide open for her. And if she put her mind to it, she could achieve anything. Connie saw her daughter for the last time on Sunday, September 2nd, 2012. The family was celebrating Connie's birthday early, and after Faith's waitressing shift at Red Robin in Durham, Faith and her roommate, Karina Rosario, drove to Warren County to join them. Connie added, We were just hanging out, enjoying time with the family. I had no idea my world was about to turn upside down. On Tuesday, my birthday, Faith called me, wished me happy birthday, and that was it. That was the last time I spoke to my baby girl. On Wednesday that same week, Faith also touched base with her father. She texted him to tell him about her plans to join UNC's chapter of the Native American Alpha Pi Omega. It's like she always knew the right time to text me. She sensed it, Roland said. She asked Dad, what's wrong? And I told her what was going on, and she told me to just have faith. She was always thinking of other people. That was the thing about her. She was beautiful on the outside, of course, but she also had this beauty on the inside. She always made me feel like I was the most special person in the world. It was the last conversation Roland would have with his daughter. A little more than 24 hours later, Faith was dead. According to Assistant Chapel Hill Police Chief Salisa Lehu, Faith attended a rush event for Alpha Pi Omega around 6 p.m. on Thursday, September 6. She later went to Davis Library on the UNC campus to study with her roommate, Karina. After a few hours of studying, Faith and Karina went home to the off-campus apartment they shared on Old Chapel Hill Road in Durham. They left the apartment again that night just after midnight. Security footage shows the women arriving at the now-closed nightclub the thrill in downtown Chapel Hill. 
It was a popular club among college students because it admitted patrons under the legal drinking age of 21 to dance. Karina later told police she felt sick to her stomach and they decided to go home. Security cameras show Faith and Karina leaving the club around 2. 30 a.m., they were home at the apartment in Durham by 3 a.m., according to a neighbor who told police she heard the girls moving around. Around the same time, records show Faith's Facebook page was accessed. About an hour later, Karina left the apartment with a friend who came to pick her up, Lee confirmed. When she left, she knew Faith to be in her bed. Police said the door was left unlocked. The next morning, Karina tried to call Faith for a ride home. But when she didn't answer, Karina called another friend. According to Lehu, they arrived at the apartment to find Faith dead, partially nude, wrapped in a comforter that had been on the bed. There was a significant amount of blood in the room, and Faith had suffered what appeared to be severe head trauma, Lehu added. According to the 911 call that was later released, Karina told the operator that she found Faith unconscious in the bedroom. When asked if Faith was breathing, Karina responded, I don't know. I don't think so. There's blood everywhere. Faith's mother, Connie, got the call while she was at work in Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. They told me Faith is dead, Connie told Daitlin. I didn't believe her. How can Faith be dead? I asked if it was a car accident or something, but no, it wasn't that. This didn't make sense. When I got off the phone, it just hit me. I burst into tears. Connie said she was in shock, but knew she had to deliver the heartbreaking news to Faith's father and to her sister and brother. The following days, weeks, and even months were a blur for Faith's family. The police investigation stretched on for two years. In 2014, just days before the second anniversary of Faith's murder, Durham County Court officials unsealed documents in the search for her killer. The autopsy report, which was also unsealed at that time, revealed what her family already knew. Faith had died from blunt force trauma to the head. The report also detailed cuts and bruises on her arms and legs, along with blood under her fingernails. Investigators believe the murder weapon to be an empty Bacardi rum bottle. The bottle was found in the bedroom with tissue fragments and DNA on it. Also found in the bedroom near Faith's body was a fast food bag with a handwritten note that read, I am not stupid. Investigators said, each bit of evidence we receive is another piece of the puzzle we use to put the complete story together. We don't count out any evidence and we are constantly reviewing. A DNA profile was created from DNA collected from the scene and semen collected in a sexual assault kit. Investigators believe the DNA belongs to the killer. Chapel Hill Police Chief Chris Blue said in a 2014 press conference. Police and family members believe Faith likely knew the person or persons involved in her murder. But because of Faith's social, bubbly personality, they discovered she was connected to a large circle of friends that extended across the college campus and beyond. She never met a stranger, Faith's father, Roland said. She was just a joy to be around, and goofy. Goofy like me, and just loved to laugh. She was friends with everyone. According to earlier reports, more than one person of interest was questioned, but were cleared when their DNA did not match the DNA found at the scene. Approximately 2,000 people have been questioned, and the DNA of more than 100 people has been tested. But nearly eight years later, there's still not a match. We continue to use all tools that are available to us, Assistant Chief of Police Salisa Lehu said. We can't point to any one thing that will lead to an arrest. We will not give up until we can give Faith's family the closure they deserve. Lee Hugh said the department has strong evidence in the case, and it's not a question of if the case will be solved, but when. We are constantly looking at the case file and following up on leads and using new technology and evidence procedures, Lee Hugh said. It will be solved. Faith's sister, Rolanda, told Dateline she believes the department is working hard to solve the case. 
but didn't think it would take eight years. She added, Nothing ever prepares you for this. I miss hearing her call me Ro in her little faith voice. So many years have passed, but I'm hopeful we'll get closure. I'm always hopeful. Faith's father fears that as the years slip by, the truth of what happened to his daughter will never be known. With each year, instead of getting closer, I feel like we're getting further away from knowing why someone would do this to her, he said. Faith not only made an impact when she was alive, but her legacy lives on now with the Faith Hedgepeth Memorial Scholarship. The scholarship is offered to help a Native American woman from a North Carolina tribe earn a higher education. Connie said they have given out 22 $1,000 scholarships in the years since Faith's murder. The family offered a $40,000 reward for information that leads to the arrest of the person responsible for Faith's murder. In 2021, the Chapel Hill Police Department announced during a press conference that they arrested 28-year-old Miguel Enrique Salguero Olivares and charged him with first-degree murder in connection with the crime. He is being held at the Durham County Detention Center without bond. The assistant police chief said Olivares was not a suspect at the beginning of the investigation. Salguero Olivares' DNA matched cement samples collected at the crime scene. His appearance also matched the DNA profile sketch created by Parabon Nanolabs that police released in 2016. Salguro Olivares' mother following the arrest claimed that her son didn't attend UNC at Chapel Hill or have friends there. My son is not a murderer. I believe in my son. I believe it, she said. He said he don't know the girl. Connie Hedgepeth, Faith's mother, stated following the announcement of the suspect's arrest. When I got the news this morning, I didn't do anything but cry. And thank God and praise God. North Carolina Attorney General Josh Stein said police detectives and SBI agents conducted thousands of interviews as part of the investigation. She thanked the Chapel Hill Police Department and SBI for their work on the case. Connie Hedgepeth said when I cried, it was tears of joy, tears of relief that someone had been arrested. Eliza Fletcher, a Memphis teacher and mother of two, got up on the morning of September 2, 2022, and went for a run. She took her usual route close to the University of Memphis, but she was never seen alive again. Horrifying surveillance footage captured the 34-year-old being snatched and bundled into an SUV. Three days later, her body was found dumped near an abandoned building, her running gear discarded close by. Fletcher, known to family and friends as Liza, was out on her regular morning jog at around 4.20 a.m. on September 2, 2022, when the abduction unfolded. Surveillance footage captured the mother of two, dressed in a pink jogging top and purple running shorts, running close to the University of Memphis campus. The footage showed a black 2013 GMC Terrain SUV driving past her before pulling up. A man was then seen getting out of it before he ran aggressively toward the jogger. A violent struggle broke out and the man forced Fletcher into the passenger side of the vehicle. The car then remained on the scene with the two inside for around four minutes before driving off. The footage shows. Fletcher's family reported her missing when she failed to return home from her run. The jogger's cell phone and water bottle were discovered at the site of her abduction. Investigators also found a pair of champion slide shoes, believed to belong to Henderson, which were left behind in the struggle. Photos of the suspect vehicle were released to the public to help track down the missing mother of two. Surveillance footage captured the same SUV stalking the area where Fletcher was taken just 24 minutes before the kidnapping. Law enforcement officers spent days combing the area near where Fletcher disappeared, including searching through dumpsters, ponds, and parks. Then, just after 5 p.m. on September 5, 2022, Three days on from her disappearance, officers found the victim's body close to an abandoned elementary school in South Memphis, 
The grim discovery was made less than a mile from where a witness told police they had seen Henderson vigorously cleaning an SUV matching the via bound Fletcher's pair of purple Lululemon running shorts discarded in a trash bag nearby. A shell casing was also recovered from the area. Surveillance footage showed Henderson's black GMC terrain nearby between 5.48 a.m. and 5.52 a.m. The autopsy later revealed that Fletcher suffered blunt force trauma to her right leg and was shot in the back of her head from an indeterminate range. There are two semicircular defects to the skull consistent with a single gunshot to the head, with the bullet traveling in a posterior to anterior, back to front, and right to left direction. The report said, adding she also had jaw fractures. U.S. Marshals spotted a vehicle matching the description of the suspect's car in a parking lot close to Henderson's home. The SUV had the same damaged taillight and partial license plate identification seen in the surveillance footage of the abduction. When officers found Henderson nearby, he tried to flee the scene, but he was arrested on September 3, 2022, just 24 hours on from the teacher's abduction and two days before her body was found and taken in for questioning. On September 4, 2022, Memphis police announced that he had been charged with aggravated kidnapping and tampering with evidence. The following afternoon, Memphis police charged Henderson with three additional charges, identity theft, theft of property under $1,000 and fraudulent use of a credit card. Henderson was spotted cleaning the inside of his car and washing his clothes in the sink in the aftermath of the abduction. A witness and the suspect's brother said they saw him behaving oddly at his house and undergoing the clean later on, September 2, 2022. Even after the clean authorities said they have recovered blood and other evidence inside the vehicle, leading them to believe Fletcher suffered a serious injury. Cell phone location data also placed Henderson at the scene of the abduction and the champion slides found at the scene were tied to him through both DNA evidence and surveillance footage. Henderson reportedly refused to tell investigators where Fletcher was or what happened to her. When police found her body, Henderson was hit with new charges of first-degree murder and first-degree murder in perpetration of kidnapping. He was initially held on $500,000 bond and made his first court appearance on September 6, 2022. Henderson made a second appearance in the Shelby County Circuit Court on the morning of September 7, 2022, where a judge revoked his bond. It was during this appearance that he asked that he be addressed as Cleotha Henderson instead of Cleotha Abston. After the court appearance, Shelby County jail records showed he was listed as Cleotha Henderson. The suspect's brother, Mario Abston, was also arrested and charged following the police search of their home. Mario Abston is charged with one count of possession with intent to distribute heroin, one count with intent to distribute fentanyl, and felony possession of a firearm. Henderson, 38 has a long rap sheet prior to Fletcher's kidnap and murder. From the age of 11, he was in the juvenile system and was known to be part of the Lemoyne Gardens Gangsta's gang. Between 1995 and May 2000, he was arrested 16 times, including for the alleged rape of a man when he was aged 14, theft, aggravated assault, and unlawful possession of a weapon. At the age of 16, he kidnapped a man at gunpoint. After being convicted, he was released from prison less than two years before Fletcher's murder. In an eerily similar situation to the kidnapping of Fletcher, Henderson, then aged 16, bundled a Memphis attorney into his vehicle in an early morning attack. On May 24, 2000, at around 2 a.m., Henderson approached Kemper Durand in his vehicle got out and forced the attorney into the trunk of his car. He then drove the victim around for several hours before taking him to an ATM where he robbed him. The victim was saved when he shouted for help from a passerby, prompting his attacker to flee the scene. Henderson was later arrested and pleaded guilty in 2001 to aggravated kidnapping. He was sentenced to 24 years in prison and was released in November 2020 
after serving 19 years. One year after his release, and one year before Fletcher's abduction and murder, Henderson allegedly raped a woman in September 2021. Alicia Franklin claims that she met Henderson on a dating app in 2021, and they made plans to go for dinner together. The suspect then held her at gunpoint, blindfolded her, and threatened to kill her before walking her to his car. He then allegedly forced her into the back seat of the car where he raped her. Mrs. Franklin reported the assault to the police, but Henderson was not arrested at the time because of a long delay in processing the rape kit. Henderson's DNA was in the system from his prior convictions, but her alleged rapist's DNA was not entered into the National Law Enforcement Database until September 5, 2021, three days after Fletcher's abduction. Henderson is now also charged over the 2021 rape. He is also charged over a robbery, which took place on September 1, 2021, one day before Fletcher's abduction. Henderson has pleaded guilty to all charges. One evening in April 2005, Raven Abaroa said he was out playing soccer when he returned to his family's North Carolina home to discover a horrifying scene. He told police he found his wife, 25-year-old Janet Abaroa, stabbed to death in an upstairs office. Nothing else in the house was disturbed, according to authorities, and the couple's six-month-old son, Caden, was left unharmed in another room. Raven Abaroa told a 911 dispatcher at the time, she's been shot or something. There's blood everywhere. Who killed Janet Abaroa was a mystery that captivated the Durham, North Carolina, suburbs, and the case remained unsolved for years. Janet Christensen, the seventh of ten siblings, grew up in a Mormon family. She met Raven Abaroa, also a Mormon, in 1998 at Southern Virginia University, where she played soccer. He was a fellow soccer player who instantly swept her off her feet. She was beautiful, attractive. I just felt so much comfort when I was with her, Raven Abaroa said in an interview in 2007. And we started this journey of getting to know each other, and it was an amazing journey. In August 2000, after two years together, Janet and Raven Abaroa married at the Mormon Temple in Washington, D.C. They settled in southeastern Virginia. Her friends and family thought that life for the newlywed couple was perfect. Soon after their wedding, a job opportunity moved the couple to Durham, North Carolina, where they both took positions at a sporting goods company. Janet Abaroa's sisters told ABC News that at the time, the couple was beginning to have some marital problems. The Abaroas welcome a son. He came to her one day because he wanted to be out of the marriage, said Sanja, Flood, Janet Abaroa's sister and explained to her that he had been cheating on her with several different people. And very soon after that, she found out that she was pregnant. It should have been the happiest time of Janet and Raven Abaroa's lives, but instead Janet Abaroa confided in her family that she felt helpless. Her older sister, Dana Kendall, told 2020 that Janet didn't want to raise the baby as a single mother. but. It seemed to friends and family that the young couple worked things out and welcomed their son Caden on October 17, 2004. He promised, swore up and down, that he would no longer cheat on her, that she was the only one for him. He would make it work, Flood said. With the birth of their baby boy, the Abaroa's marriage seemed to be on the mend, until they suffered yet another blow. Raven Abaroa was caught stealing from the sports apparel company, where they both worked in December 2004. Mortified, Janet Abaroa resigned from her job. He eventually pleaded guilty to five charges of embezzlement, but would avoid serving any jail time. On April 26, 2005, Raven Abaroa said his wife had been getting ready for bed around 8 p.m. when he left to play soccer with friends according to the account he gave police about that night. He said he returned home after 10 p.m. and found Janet Abaroa's body with multiple stab wounds. In a 911 call, 
Raven Abaroa told the operator. My wife is dead. She's been shot. There's blood everywhere. She's not breathing. Although Abaroa said his wife had been shot, Durham police quickly realized that she had been stabbed. Shortly after his wife's death, Raven Abaroa moved to Salt Lake City, Utah, with their son. There, he eventually met Vanessa Pond, a single mother whose daughter was in the same day care program as Abaroa's son, Caden. Raven seemed very upfront, very honest and genuine, Vanessa Pond said. And I found out that he was a single father. And I really, really admired that. They started dating and Pond told 2020 that Abaroa mentioned his wife had died. She said she felt so sorry for him and Caden. They decided to move in together. Pond went online to find out more about the death of Raven Abaroa's first wife. She told a BC News at the time she wasn't convinced Raven Abaroa was innocent. But after asking him questions, she said he removed any and every doubt from my mind. He had his stories about how people were trying to frame him, about how horrible the cops were, and how he continued to try to contact the police to find out what's going on, said Pond. In summer 2008, three years after Janet Abaroa's death was still unsolved, Pond and Raven Abaroa were married in the backyard of her parents' home. When Janet Abaroa's sisters learned he was engaged, they said they felt they had to reach out to his new fiance. We just wanted her to make sure she was aware of the things that had been in the news about him, that she would know what she was getting into, and that we were fearful for her, said Janet's sister, Dana Kendall. I was heartbroken, Pond said. I did not want to believe at all that he had done this. Not long after, Pond said Raven Abaroa began acting in ways she didn't understand. Within moments, he could switch. He could say the most horrible things, Pond said, and then moments later, he would apologize. The outbursts, Pond said, became physical. He grabbed me from the door and threw me up against the wall, and then I fell, Pond said. Later, he tried to convince me that I had tripped. A new detective is assigned to Janet Abaroa's case. Just four months into their marriage, Pond said she feared for her safety. The couple separated and the marriage was annulled. Pond went public in spring 2009 with her fears that he killed his first wife. The Durham police assigned a new detective to Janet Abaroa's case, Sol. Raven never kept the lies straight, Sol told 2020. His statements to law enforcement initially, they were contradictory. Then, as he was reviewing the crime scene photos, Sol said something stuck out to him as odd. I noticed the contact case on the counter with the top off of it, indicating to me that the likelihood that the contacts were probably not in there, which would be contrary to her going to bed. Or, as Raven said, in the bed going to sleep. Sol said, when police interviewed Janet Abaroa's family and friends, Sol said they told them Janet Abaroa was consistent with removing her contacts before going to sleep. He said he found this detail suspicious. Then the next thing, Sol said, is not seeing any disturbance based on the manner of her death. A stabbing, I mean, is not immediate. It's usually violent, with struggling, a disturbance. Raven Abaroa was arrested on February 1st, 2010, and charged with first-degree murder in the death of his first wife. In July 2010, Janet Abaroa's body was exhumed, and authorities determined that she had been wearing contacts when she was buried. After I received these fragments and I then cleaned them, I think washed them with sterile water to get a better view," said Dr. Charles Whirling an ophthalmologist who examined the remains. The material actually swelled from the water and resumed a convex shape typical of your contact lens. But the key finding was finding the numbers 123 on sample A. This was conclusive evidence that this was an AcuV contact lens. In order to demonstrate how a contact lens decays over a period of time, if it were buried with a body, 
Zwirling conducted a recreation using sets of pig eyes in three separate boxes. I applied the contact lens, said Zwirling. I applied a lens cap, which is done at your funeral home. I used the same solutions, even the same linen, and I got these little caskets, these wooden boxes, and I put the pig eyes in them and buried them actually in my backyard. And then, after six months, I exhumed the first box, and so forth. The final analysis showed that the contact lenses did change just like the one we discovered, he added. Apparently, this evidence was crucial in determining a flaw in Raven Abaroa's story. Raven Abaroa goes to trial and faces his second wife in court. During his trial, which began in 2013, Prosecutors presented Raven Abaroa as a controlling husband. Pond, who testified as a witness for the prosecution, detailed how she saw Raven Abaroa become violent on the soccer field and how his aggression turned on her. When he sees weakness, he just comes at you harder and harder, Pond said in court. He told me how much he hated me and how much it didn't matter if I died. Abaroa's defense team argued that the prosecution's evidence against their client was mostly circumstantial, and police had ignored evidence, including a bloody shoe print, that they said could have pointed to a different killer. In May 2013, the jury failed to reach a verdict, deadlocking 11 to 1 on a guilty verdict, and the judge declared a mistrial. Before Raven Abaroa's second trial was supposed to begin in March 2014, he entered an Alford plea for voluntary manslaughter, acknowledging that there was evidence to convict him, but not admitting guilt. I was shocked. But more than that, I was shocked at what the plea deal turned out to be, Pond said. That's not justice at all. It's not justice. A judge sentenced him to between 95 and 123 months in jail, but he was granted credit for the four years he had spent behind bars before, and during his trial, which was applied as time served, Raven Abaroa did not testify at his trial, but he spoke in court in 2014 after being sentenced. I would just like to state that I didn't receive a fair trial the first time. I don't think I'll receive a fair trial a second time, he told the court at the time. I don't think it's worth risking the possibility of spending the rest of my life in prison for something I didn't do. I take this plea to ensure that doesn't happen, and that's the only reason. I didn't kill my wife. Abaroa, now 39, was released from prison on Christmas Day, 2017. He now lives in Utah. The rape and brutal murder of an elderly woman found stabbed to death in her home in San Diego, California, 25 years ago has finally been solved. On February 29, 1992, Kleinzorge was found dead in her home at 5600 Gaines Street, near Linda Vista Road. Haiti, who called her mother every day to check on her, had spoken to her the day before the murder. On the morning of February 29, Haiti called her mother three times, but got no answer. She knew something was wrong, said San Diego PD Chief Shelley Zimmerman. Haiti rushed over to her mother's home. Immediately, she noticed something was amiss when she saw the garage light on and the blinds shuttered. When Haiti went inside the house, she made the grisly discovery. Her mother's body lay lifeless on the floor beside her bed. Kleinzerge had been sexually assaulted and stabbed several times on her neck. According to investigators, the killer entered Kleinzorge's home through a window and attacked her. For decades, Kleinzorge's murder remained unsolved. At the time, authorities said regular DNA testing did not match anyone in a statewide offender database. Kleinzorge was born in Germany in 1907. She immigrated to the United States, where she met her husband, Paul. The couple moved to California started a landscaping business and raised their family in a modest home in the quiet San Diego suburb of Linda Vista. The couple lived the American dream and tried to give back to their community. The Kleinsorges were founding members of the House of Germany at the International Cottages in Balboa Park. 
They took tremendous pride in their German-American heritage, the police chief said. Paul died in 1971. Angela Kleinsorge continued to live at the family's home, where, as she grew older, she settled into a quiet life. She had a daily routine that included waking up at 6 a.m. for coffee and breakfast, watching soap operas and working in her garden. She was beloved by her children, family, and friends. San Diego law enforcement announced the major break in 2017 in the quarter-century-old cold case killing of Angela Kleinsorge, 84. Her killer was Jeffrey Falls, a man who lived across the street from the victim, according to DNA testing and investigators. The victim's daughter, Heidi Kleinsorge, said to learn that it had been a neighbor. It was just horrifying to us. Falls is no longer alive. He was killed in a 2006 crash. However, a rare procedure known as familial DNA testing helped San Diego law enforcement zero in on him as the killer. The cold case finally began to crack in July 2016 when this type of advanced science came into the equation. In 2015, the San Diego Police Department and the San Diego District Attorney's Office submitted the cold case to the Department of Justice with a request for familial DNA testing, a process that allows investigators to widen their scope when searching offender databases. Through the process, investigators may be able to identify people who are likely to be close relatives of a person who may have committed a crime. The familial DNA results from this case matched a convicted offender who was dead, according to the DA's office. The results showed there was a high likelihood that a brother of that convict was the man who killed Kleinsorge. As investigators researched this break in the case, they discovered the convict had two brothers, one who was alive and another, Falls, 42, who was killed in a 2006 motorcycle accident. San Diego PD detectives were able to give the living brother a DNA test, and he was eliminated as a suspect in the cold case. After that, it was time to test Falls. The DA's office said the coroner gave tissue samples from Falls to San Diego PD lab criminalist Adam Dutra. The crime lab obtained a partial DNA profile from Falls' tissue. At this point, the breakthrough nearly 25 years in the making unfolded. The DA's office said Falls' DNA matched a sample collected at the scene of Kleinsorge's slaying, pointing to him as her killer. The likelihood ratio for kinship between the crime scene sample and falls is in the quadrillions, San Diego County District Attorney Bonnie Dumanis said at the news conference. Finally, the case had been solved. District Attorney Dumanis said the familial DNA testing results have brought a measure of closure to the Kleinsorge family. Although a rare procedure, Bonnie touted the science as a way to propel an investigation forward and solve more crimes. Kleinsorge's surviving daughter, Heidi spoke about what this means for her family, pained for so long by her mother's murder. When you lose a loved one to a brutal and violent act and there's no one charged with the crime, you often wonder if the criminal wakes up in the morning, thinks that he got away with murder or if he even gives it a second thought, said Heidi. After 25 years, we have our answer. While we have only partial closure, at least we know Mr. Falls no longer thinks he got away with the rape and murder of our mother. On July 15, 1984, athlete Carrie Swenson was on a training run near Big Sky, Montana, when she encountered Don and Dan Nichols. Kari, a world champion athlete whose career was cut short in 1984, when she was abducted by the deranged father and son in the mountains of Montana, tied to a tree, and shot as her friend died trying to save her. The father and son hoped to make Carrie Dan's bride, after capturing her and dragging her deep into the woods, with plans of starting a new family in the wilderness. Kari was found 18 hours later, tied to a tree and suffering from a gunshot wound to the torso. Her friend, Alan Goldstein, lay dead beside her, shot and killed by Don, 
when Alan stumbled across the campsite. Miraculously, Carrie was still alive, but the father-son duo were nowhere to be found. Forest rangers, SWAT teams, and anti-terrorist units scoured Montana's backcountry in search of Don and Dan Nichols. It would be five months before authorities caught wind of the pair. After receiving a tip about a suspicious campfire in the dead of winter, Sheriff Johnny France went to investigate alone, leading to a showdown that will have you on the edge of your seat. Curry Swenson's harrowing ordeal was recently featured on an episode of Investigation Discovery's series Your Worst Nightmare. The episode, titled Into the Wild, features a reenactment of the horrific events that took place in 1984. Sheriff Johnny France and author Malcolm McConnell recount this terrifying true crime in their book, Incident at Big Sky. Kari was halfway around the small lake. The trail was hardly wider than a deer path, and steep, following the sharp contour of the pothole lake shore. She splashed through a stream and puffed up a sharp rise. Here, the pines were even thicker than up on the ridge. But ahead to the left, the trail opened again, a clear route, cutting up the slope among the dense deadfalls to rejoin the ridge. That should be Jack Creek Trail, and if she followed it, her route would cross the logging road again, and she could head back to the trailhead where she'd parked her car. Just before the end of the lake, the trail climbed another rise into dense timber, and Carrie stared intently at the ground to avoid injury in the roots and stones. Two men appeared, not ten feet away. The older man stood to the left, one foot on the trail. The younger man was half hidden in the trees to the right, five feet off the path. Her first reaction was surprise, then apprehension. These men were dirty. They did not look like fishermen from Big Sky, and they stood very still, watching her with flat, dark eyes, expressionless, just staring at her body. Now she saw their green backpacks, propped against a tree at trailside. Kari slowed, breaking stride. Two rifles leaned against the tree near the packs. July was a long time before any legal hunting season, and these two guys with their grungy beards and sooty clothes sure did not look like wardens from the fiction game. As she stumbled ahead, she realized that they both wore holstered pistols and thick-bladed hunting knives. The older man's face was almost hidden beneath a matted gray beard and the brim of a greasy cowboy hat, but the intense blue eyes frightened her. Even on first sight, she realized that he was not normal. She slowed more when she saw the younger man was staring at her body, his lips grim. He bore a certain resemblance to the older man, but his beard was blonde and thinner. His eyes were deep brown. Kari was shaky and dry-mouthed but she did not panic. These two men were definitely grungy, some kind of rough misfits, but they had not actually attacked her. She did not intend to give them the chance. She decided to run right past them, up the ridge and back to the Jack Creek logging road, where there might be hikers. Without a word, the older man stepped onto the trail, blocking her way. Kari stumbled to a stop, but still overcame the natural panic reaction rising inside her. Maybe, she thought, if I just ask directions, I can keep the conversation short, then turn around and leave. Hi, she began, keeping her tone normal. Is this the trail to Jack Creek? Yeah, the old man answered. He formed a quizzical smile. This is the Jack Creek Trail, all right. Thanks, Carrie blurted out, then spun to dash back along her original route. Before she could complete her turn, the older man seized both her wrists in a grip so tight she felt her bones might crack. Please let me go, she cried. No, we don't want to let you go. The old man's voice was amazingly calm, as if he were discussing the weather. Kari struggled against his grip, twisting her weight right and left. What do you want? She demanded, anger overcoming her initial fear. Why won't you let me go? Well, he began, we don't meet many beautiful women up in the mountains, and we just want to talk to you for a while. He shrugged. The boy remained silent, staring. 
Kari was not taken in for a moment. She understood exactly what they wanted from her. Well, she said coldly, I sure don't want to talk to you. Let me go. Again, she twisted. Again, the old man held her tight. They were so close together that she was engulfed in his stale, smoky odor. All we want is some conversation, the old man said. I know what you want. Carrie's outrage grew as her fear and frustration mounted. Well, the old man said, almost indignant himself now. We're not going to rape you, if that's what you're worried about. I don't believe you, Carrie said. What do you really want me for? The old man formed a lopsided smile beneath his beard. Just for conversation, like I said. Kari had stopped struggling momentarily, but now she resumed. Once more, his grip defeated her. He did not appear to be exceptionally strong, but she realized his lean frame was deceptive. What's your name? His voice seemed more relaxed now. Kari was not about to give this creepy scarecrow her real name, and she was prepared to use the question to her advantage. My name is Sue, she muttered. You work down at Big Sky? Yeah, Carrie added. I work in a kitchen. He leaned closer to watch her eyes. You married? Carrie did not hesitate. Yes, I'm married. So what's your husband's name? Bill Soa, Carrie answered, this odd name springing to her mind. Perhaps she might have thought that the name had a rugged, working-class ring to it, evocative of a vengeful young husband. Where's your wedding ring? he demanded, twisting her left hand open to examine the fingers. I don't wear a wedding ring, she said, working in the kitchen with those machines and all. A ring could get caught and rip your finger off. The old man examined her hand more closely. I don't believe you. It doesn't look like you've ever worn one. There was a cold, bullying dogmatism to his manner now, as if he were being rational and Carrie herself was creating a problem. No, Carrie said desperately. I don't wear one. And my husband doesn't either because he works in the kitchen too. You believe her? The old man turned to the boy. For the first time, the young man spoke. She's lying. All women lie. His voice was flat, a bizarre copy of the old man's. The boy moved closer now, and she could smell the same rancid, smoky odor as the old man's. But he didn't seem as calm about this whole nasty business as the older man. The boy was searching about to get a better view through the trees, both back down the trail and up across the ridge. Clearly, he was worried that a hiker or fisherman might stumble on them, out here in the open, on the lakeshore trail. Please let me go, Carrie said, looking up again. You don't want to get involved in something like this. The old man did not answer. She turned to directly address the boy for the first time. You're young, she pleaded. You don't want to get involved in this. It doesn't make sense. Mosquitoes swarmed on her legs and arms now, but she was powerless to brush them off. For an uncertain moment, no one spoke. Finally, the old man asked, Well, Danny, what do you think? Shall we keep her? The boy nodded decisively. Yeah, let's keep her. By nightfall, Swenson's disappearance had been noticed, and her family planned search parties. Volunteers split off in twos to scout along the woods. One pair involved 30-year-old Jim Schwalbe, a landscaper from Wisconsin, and Alan Goldstein, a 36-year-old retailer turned rancher. While stumbling through the woods to a nearby road around 7.30 a.m., the two got separated. Then Schwalbe heard a gunshot, a scream, and three voices. One female, two male. He broke through to the camp and found two men standing above Swenson, who was bleeding from the chest. The four stood in shock. The younger Nichols was nearly crying, Schwalbe recalled repeating something about how he hadn't meant to hit her. The older Nichols pointed his rifle at Schwalbe when Goldstein arrived on sight and tried to intervene. Don Nichols fired, hitting Goldstein in the face as Schwalbe sprinted away. The Nichols packed up their camp, 
unchained Swenson and abandoned her to bleed out. Swenson lay on the ground for four hours. She crawled into a nearby sleeping bag, nibbled at a chocolate bar, swigged from a lemonade, and tried not to pass out. A helicopter found her at 11.55 a.m. Once at the hospital, Swenson stabilized. But the aftermath proved nightmarish. For months, the Nichols evaded capture and the manhunt became a regular feature on the news. When a local sheriff finally caught the kidnappers, he wrote a book about it, which was adapted as a TV movie. The abduction of Carrie Swenson, just three years later, everyone had a theory about the Nichols, about their non-conformist philosophy, about what had driven them into the mountains. And then to abduction. The Nichols boys were branded survivalists and mountain men. When Don and Dan went to trial in Virginia City, Montana, tourists asked for their autographs. When the son was sentenced to 10 years in prison and the father to 85, news segments conducted jailhouse interviews and published their letters from jail. From the headlines, it was easy to conclude the Nichols were rugged outlaws, frontiersmen who did what they wanted, took what they could, and made no apologies. Swenson rarely spoke to media. She went on to become a small animal veterinarian and largely left public life. In 2012, after Dan had been released from prison, rearrested on drug charges, and targeted by a federal arrest warrant after ditching his trial, Swenson wrote an article for the Montana Pioneer mocking their moniker Mountain Men and warning against Don's possible parole. The Nichols lived in the mountains part-time, but they couldn't survive there, Swenson wrote. At least not without poaching, breaking into cabins and stealing supplies, leaving the mountains for months at a time, and purchasing modern equipment. Ultimately, they were caught without a fight because they were cold, hungry, and tired of living in the mountains. These are not mountain men. On a July night in 2003, Christine Paolila gunned down four of her friends in a fit of jealousy that is now known as the Clear Lake Massacre. Christine fatally shot Rachel Coloradis, Tiffany Rowell, Marcus Priscilla, and Adelbert Sanchez in Rowell's Clear Lake City, Texas home, on July 18, 2003. At the time of the murders, she was just 17 years old. She committed the crimes alongside her boyfriend, Christopher Snyder. For three years, the two of them evaded capture as police struggled to identify the culprits. Then, an anonymous tip in 2006 led investigators straight to Paolila. The vicious Clear Lake massacre had been solved at last, and the families of the victims finally had the answers they'd sought for years. Christine Marie Paolila was born on Long Island, New York, on March 31, 1986, her father died in a construction accident when she was just two years old. Her mother, Lori, later moved the family to the suburbs of Houston. When she was in kindergarten, Paolila was diagnosed with alopecia, a condition that caused her hair, eyebrows, and eyelashes to fall out. She also struggled with poor vision and had to wear thick glasses. Sadly, her appearance made her a target of cruel jokes and teasing by her peers, which caused low self-esteem. Paolilla faced severe bullying every day during her school years due to the wigs she wore and the eyebrows she drew on each morning to conceal her baldness. In an interview, Lori Paolilla described the pain her daughter went through that was devastating. She had poor vision, so she had what I guess most folks would know as Coke bottle glasses and started being ridiculed by young children. Classmates would come up behind her, pull her wig off her head. It was so painful to watch. Christine Paolila attended Clear Lake High School in Houston. She eventually befriended two popular students, Rachel Coloradis and Tiffany Rowell. The girls taught her how to change her appearance with makeup and clothing to better fit in with her peers. The transformation was so drastic that in 2003, Paolila's fellow classmates voted her Miss Irresistible. 
Around the same time, Paolila began dating 21-year-old Christopher Lee Snyder, who was a known criminal. Paolila's mother and stepfather disapproved of their relationship, as did Coloradus and Raul. Snyder's frequent drug use and extensive criminal record concerned those who cared about the young, impressionable girl. Unfortunately, their concerns were validated when Paolila began using drugs herself. According to Snyder's family, the relationship was doomed from the start. They cited the vicious arguments Paolila and Snyder frequently had. One even resulted in Paolila spending the night on the front lawn of his family's home, threatening to kill them all. Still, Paolila stubbornly refused to leave Snyder, a decision that would have tragic results. On July 18, 2003, Christine Paolila and Christopher Snyder visited Tiffany Rowell's home in Clear Lake City, where Coloradus, Rowell's boyfriend Marcus Priscilla, and Priscilla's cousin Adalbert Sanchez were all hanging out together. The plan was to simply steal drugs from the house and leave. But the evening took a dark turn when Snyder began arguing with Priscilla. The confrontation escalated, and Snyder and Paolilla began shooting. It's not clear who killed who, but the couple fired at least 40 rounds in total. All four of the victims had numerous bullet wounds, and Raul and Coloradus were both shot in the groin. Coloradus initially survived the onslaught and began to crawl through a puddle of her own blood to reach the phone and call 911. When Paolilla saw that she was still alive, she began viciously beating her to death with the butt of a revolver while Coloradus cried out, Why? Less than an hour after committing the murders, Snyder drove Paolila to Walgreens so she could clock into her job at the makeup counter like nothing had happened. Due to a lack of evidence at the crime scene, police initially suspected the murders were drug-related. It wasn't until 2006 that the truth came out. For three years, the cold-blooded Clear Lake massacre went unsolved. Paolila and Snyder broke up in 2004 after he went to jail for stealing a car. She entered rehab in Texas, where she met her soon-to-be husband, Stanley Justin Rott. The two tied the knot in March 2005. Four months later, on the second anniversary of the murders, Paolila came across a news report about the unsolved case on TV. When she saw the composite sketches of the suspects, she confessed to Rott that she and Snyder were responsible. The couple went into hiding, living out of a motel room in San Antonio. A year later, police received an anonymous tip. The caller said he had met Paolila in rehab, and she had confessed to him that she had murdered the four victims in the Clear Lake Massacre. Acting on this information, authorities arrested Christine Paolila outside her motel room Rott told the police about his wife's confession, and he revealed to them a shocking twist to the story. Paolila had told him that she saw Coloradus still clinging to life and decided to finish her off by bludgeoning her friend to death. When interrogated by detectives, Paolila shifted all the blame onto her former boyfriend, Snyder. She claimed that it was Snyder who came up with the idea to rob her friends but their plans went terribly wrong. Both Paolila and Snyder, who was still at large, were charged with capital murder. Snyder found out about the arrest warrant against him and took his own life in August 2006. In October 2008, Paolila was found guilty of four counts of capital murder. As she was a juvenile at the time of the crimes, she avoided the death penalty and instead received a life sentence. The question remains, why did she do it? Christine Paolila never apologized for the killings, and she has never given a motive. However, psychiatrist Gail Saltz believes that her actions were driven by envy and jealousy towards her popular friends. Snyder's sister Brandy agrees that jealousy was the motive for murder. According to reports, Brandy said, I remember her being intensely jealous. There must have been some underlying jealousy between Paolila and Coloradus. When I saw photos of Coloradus, I knew instantly. She was very beautiful.
Brenda Lafferty was beautiful, intelligent, and assertive. And those were some of the reasons why her brothers-in-law, Ron and Dan Lafferty, decided to murder her and her 15-month-old daughter, Erica, in 1984. Mormon fundamentalists claiming to be guided by God, Ron, and Dan insisted that they were driven to murder by a divine message they called the removal revelation. But the truth behind their motives was far more earthbound. Ron, who had received the message, was furious with Brenda for helping his wife to leave him after he embraced polyamory. This is the story of Brenda Lafferty, whose murder by Ron and Dan Lafferty inspired the book and TV show, Under the Banner of Heaven. Brenda Lafferty was born on July 19, 1960, into a Mormon family living in Logan, Utah. She spent most of her childhood in Ithaca, New York, and Kimberly, Idaho, and enjoyed an especially close relationship with two of her sisters, Betty and Bonnie, who were around her same age. Beautiful, intelligent, and popular among her peers, Brenda used her good looks to secure a college scholarship from the Miss Twin Falls, Idaho, beauty pageant. She spent a year at the University of Idaho and the College of Southern Idaho before she transferred to Brigham Young University back in Utah. Brenda's mother had gone to BYU, and Brenda hoped to study broadcast journalism. There, Brenda also met her husband, Alan Lafferty. They quickly fell in love and married, and Brenda gave birth to their daughter, Erica Lane Lafferty, on April 28, 1983, after her college graduation. But Brenda's marriage with Alan was complex. Though the Wright family liked Alan, he could be controlling and didn't want Brenda to work. What's more, two of his brothers, Ron and Dan Lafferty, had begun to embrace an extreme form of Mormonism. They had joined a breakaway polygamous sect called the School of Prophets and started to preach it to their brothers. Ron's extremism upset his wife, Diana, who found that her husband suddenly expected a servant instead of a spouse. She confided in Brenda about the deepening cracks in her marriage, and Brenda encouraged her to take her children and leave Ron. Diana really loved Brenda, Brenda's sister, Sharon Wright stated, because all of the other Lafferty brothers had wives that they treated like second-class citizens. Brenda ended up giving Diana the courage she needed to leave. Diana took Brenda's advice, and Ron Lafferty would not soon forget it. In early 1984, shortly after the end of his marriage, Ron Lafferty claimed to have received divine instructions from God. Curiously, this revelation demanded that he murder people he blamed for his problems. Brenda, a woman named Chloe Lowe, who'd supported his wife, and a man named Richard Stowe, who had overseen Ron's excommunication from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Ron shared the message with his brother Dan and his brother Alan, Brenda's husband. Alan later testified that he responded to the message, which Dan and Ron called their removal revelation, with disbelief. I told him that God had made no such revelation to me, and I would protect Brenda and Erica with my life, he said in court. But Alan did not tell Brenda about it. If he had told Brenda about Ron's revelation, she would have been out of there in a minute, and she'd still be alive today, Brenda's sister, Betty stated. But Brenda didn't know anything about it. Indeed, Brenda Lafferty had no idea that she was in danger. And on July 24, 1984, Ron and Dan Lafferty put their murderous plan into action. Accompanied by two drifters named Charles Carnes and Richard Knapp, Ron and Dan Lafferty made their way to Brenda's apartment. While Carnes and Knapp waited in the car, they forced their way inside and began their attack. As Erica, 15 months, wailed from her crib, Carnes could hear Ron calling Brenda bad names and a liar, and the sound of the brothers physically beating her. According to testimony he gave at Ron's trial, the brothers strangled Brenda with a vacuum cord and slit her throat. Then Dan walked into baby Erica's room and slit her throat as well. I walked in Erica's room. I talked to her for a minute. I said, I'm not sure why I'm supposed to do this. 
But I guess God wants you home, Dan Lafferty said. Dan claimed that he killed Brenda as well, describing her killing like something out of the, the scriptures. But Carnes testified that Ron took credit for Brenda's death when he returned to the car. I killed her. I can't believe I killed her, Ron allegedly said. The four men went to fulfill the rest of Ron's removal revelation, but their other victims escaped unscathed. Lowe wasn't home, and they missed the turn to Stowe's house. Instead, they kept driving toward Nevada. Meanwhile, Alan Lafferty came home and discovered the gruesome scene. I went over to Brenda, and I prayed. Alan testified in court. He called the police. Alan knew exactly who had killed his wife and daughter. Ron and Dan Lafferty were arrested in Reno, Nevada, on August 7, 1984. They were soon charged with two counts of criminal homicide, two counts of aggravated burglary, and two counts of conspiracy to commit homicide. Dan was sentenced to two life terms in prison. Ron was sentenced to death, but died in 2019 before his execution. Before his wife's murder in June 2009, Eli Weaver had numerous affairs with women he met through online dating sites, where he called himself an Amish stud, but only one mistress was willing to kill for him. From the outside, it may have seemed as if Barbara Weaver had a perfectly happy life as an Amish housewife. At 30 years old, she had been married to her husband Eli for 10 years, and they had five young children together in the picturesque, conservative community of Apple Creek, Ohio. But on June 2nd, 2009, Barbara was found shot to death in her own home, and everything pointed to Eli Weaver as the culprit. The Weavers belonged to a conservative subgroup of the Old Order Amish. Their religion didn't allow them to have cell phones, internet, or even to take photos of themselves. They traveled around town by horse and buggy. But as investigators dug into the Weavers' life, they found Eli didn't exactly adhere to those rules. Not only did he have a secret cell phone, he had several extramarital affairs with other women, most of whom he found in an online chat room where he called himself Amish Stud. Who wants to do an Amish guy? His profile read, By all appearances, Barbara and Eli Weaver had a good marriage. They had a good community of friends and neighbors. Barbara was a very friendly, sociable person. She was kind of laid back, but super nice. A gentle soul, neighbor Mary Aker said in an interview. Eli was very outgoing. He would often come over fairly late in the evening and ask for a ride. And he was very considerate. He would apologize for interrupting me. He had charm. Mary was a Mennonite taxi driver, someone who would give rides to the Amish in her community to places they couldn't reach by horse and buggy. But in the later years of the Weaver's marriage, they began having problems. Eli was having several affairs, and he was withholding money from Barbara. Fanny Troyer, Barbara's sister, said Eli wouldn't even give her money to care for the children or buy groceries. Eli ran a gun store and business was fine, she said. It wasn't about the money, it was about control. The Weaver children also reportedly saw Eli physically abuse Barbara, but she never reported it because, as one Amish leader said, she would have been asked, what did you do that your husband would treat you like this? Barbara was struggling with their marital problems. She wrote in a letter to her counselor, where did my friend love, trustworthy husband go to? He hates me to the core. Eli Weaver even left his family and the church twice to live as English. Both times, he was back within a few months, begging for forgiveness. Barbara Rubber was another Mennonite taxi driver in the Apple Creek community. Barbara and Eli met in 2003, when she was 33 and he was 23. They began having an affair. In the months leading up to the murder, Weaver had been asking several people to kill his wife. Most didn't take him seriously, but he said in his testimony that when he mentioned it to Barbara, she ran away with the idea. They began plotting the murder in the fall of 2008. Barbara performed 840 internet searches on poisoning, 
and investigators found a series of text messages between Weaver and Barbara discussing the murder method. I thought if we could get that fly poison stuff in a spice cupcake, she might not detect it, reads a text message from Barbara. Maybe you could blow up the house? Eli texted Barbara. What about your kids? She asked. The kids will go to heaven because they're innocent, Weaver wrote. In the end, they settled on using a gun. But why did Eli Weaver need to kill his wife? Why didn't he just leave her? If he had left, he would have been shunned, said Andrew Hyde, Weaver's attorney. If his wife is dead, they pat him on the back. Early in the morning, on June 2nd, 2009, one of the Weaver children found their mother dead and covered in blood in her bed and ran to the neighbor's house for help. Investigators found Barbara Weaver had been shot with a 410 shotgun. There was a pile of cash in the bedroom, indicating robbery was not the motive. When Barbara was found, Eli Weaver was fishing on Lake Erie with friends. He had left at 3 a.m., but neighbors and friends of the family pointed police in the direction of Barbara Rabber, who didn't have an alibi for the time of the murder. Barbara said she took a gun from her husband's gun cabinet and admitted to entering the Weaver home at 4.30 a.m. the day of the murder. She said she didn't remember loading the weapon and claimed she only meant to scare Barbara Weaver, but the gun was discharged accidentally. On June 10th, just over a week after Barbara Weaver's murder, Eli confessed to conspiring with Barbara Raber to kill his wife. He pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder in exchange for his testimony against Raber, who was charged with murder. The trial began in September 2009. Weaver testified that he and Raber discussed the plan the day before the murder. He told her he would be leaving at 3 a.m. for a fishing trip, and the basement door would be left unlocked for her. Raber recanted her previous story saying she was never in the Weaver home. The murder weapon was never found, and Raber's prints weren't in the house. Raber's attorney argued that Eli Weaver was the one who killed Barbara, claiming he shot her before leaving for his fishing trip. But Weaver testified that he and Raber met in his barn on June 9th. He said, Raber described the murder in detail and told him she was sorry for everything, Weaver said. Raber asked him how to clean a gun so it didn't look like it had been fired recently. With the help of Weaver's testimony, Raber was convicted and sentenced to 23 years to life. Weaver was sentenced to 15 years to life as part of his plea deal. Weaver is eligible for parole next year, while Raber won't be eligible for parole until 2032. In one of her last letters to her counselor, Barbara Weaver wrote, I often think of Christ's words, forgive him, for he knows not what he does. In 2000, drug dealers kidnapped Nicholas Markowitz and then partied with him for days before finally killing him outside of Santa Barbara, providing the chilling basis for the film Alpha Dog. Nicholas Markowitz was a high school theater kid who was an avid reader. His older half-brother, Benjamin, ran with an amateur gang of wannabe tough guys who sold marijuana and ecstasy. While their parents hoped to shield Nick from those criminal elements, they came for him anyway. That seedy underbelly of the West Hills neighborhood in the San Fernando Valley consisted of high school dropouts and impressionable youths, and at its center was a man with the name of an outlaw and temperament of a bully, Jesse James Hollywood who delegated drug deals and always collected his debts. Ben Markowitz owed Hollywood 1200 when he began to distance himself. Frustrated, he couldn't muscle Ben back into the fold and determined to save his reputation. Hollywood abducted Nick Markowitz to spur his brother's repayment on August 6, 2000. But when he realized kidnapping could land him in prison, Hollywood took drastic measures and had the 15-year-old murdered. Ben was shocked. He knew his old acquaintances liked to talk tough, but he never considered they would do something like this. In my worst nightmares, he said, I never would have thought that that would have happened. Nicholas Samuel Markowitz was born on September 19, 1984, in Los Angeles, California. 
The summer before his sophomore year at El Camino, real high school, he spent most days going for walks, hanging out with his older brother, and preparing to get his driver's license. But on August 6, 2000, he was abducted at 1 p.m. after sneaking out of his house to avoid arguing with his parents, Jeff and Susan. A fellow West Hills resident, Jesse James Hollywood, came from a family of means. He had excelled at high school baseball, but was expelled during his sophomore year. When a later injury turned the 20-year-old dropout's athletic dreams into dust, he began to sell drugs. His amateur crew consisted of former school pals like 20-year-old William Skidmore, 21-year-old Jesse Rugg, and 21-year-old Benjamin Markowitz, who still owed him money. Hollywood had only been a dealer for a year when he went to collect his cash from Ben, only to happen upon Nick walking down the street. Hollywood pulled over his van and dragged Nicholas Markowitz inside with the aid of Rugge and Skidmore. A neighbor witnessed the incident and called 911 with the license plate, but police couldn't find the van. Markowitz was bound with duct tape and had his pager, wallet, Valium, and weed confiscated. Over the next two days, Markowitz was shuttled between various homes with the promise that he'd soon be freed. At Rugge's Santa Barbara house, he played video games with his captors and smoked and drank with them. Markowitz even attended their parties, making friends with 17-year-old Graham Presley. He told me that it was okay because he was doing it for his brother, and that as long as his brother was okay, he was okay, said Presley. Markowitz even declined an offer to run when Presley drove him around town, stating he didn't want to complicate a seemingly temporary matter. Hollywood even told Rugg that Markowitz would be free soon, spurring a Lemon Tree Motel pool party on August 8th. I'm going to take you home, Rugg told Markowitz that night. I'll put you on a greyhound. I'm going to get you home. Unbeknownst to his crew, Hollywood had spoken to his family lawyer and gotten lethally paranoid about a potential kidnapping charge. He became convinced that murdering Nicholas Markowitz was his only way forward and asked Ruggy to do his dirty work for him. Rugg declined, leading Hollywood to contact 21-year-old Ryan Hoyt. We got a little situation, said Hollywood. You're gonna take care of it for me. And that's how you're gonna clear your debt. Like Ben Markowitz, Hoyt owed Hollywood money. When he arrived to meet him, Hollywood handed him a semi-automatic pistol and offered to wipe the slate clean with an additional $400 payment if he killed Markowitz. In the early morning hours of August 9th, Hoyt and Rugg duct taped Markowitz's mouth and hands. With Presley, they drove Markowitz to the Lizard's Mouth Trail near Santa Barbara in the early morning hours of August 9th. They walked the terrified teen to a shallow grave at a remote campsite 12 miles away. Hitting him over the head with a shovel, Hoyt dumped him in the hole and shot him nine times. Then they covered his grave with dirt and branches and drove away. Nicholas Markowitz was found by hikers on August 12th, after which many who befriended him during captivity came forward. Police arrested Rugg, Hoyt, and Presley within a week while Hollywood had fled to Colorado before his trail went cold on August 23rd. Hollywood remained a fugitive for almost six years until he was arrested in Rio de Janeiro in 2005. Police found him under the alias of Michael Costa Guro by tracing his father's phone calls. While his friends and family painted a glowing picture at trial, he was sentenced to life in prison. Hoyt was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. Rugg was convicted of kidnapping and served 11 years, while Skidmore was convicted of the same but sentenced to nine years via plea deal. Presley, underage at the time, was sent to a juvenile facility for eight years. From the outside, it seemed as though West Virginia teenagers Rachel Schoaf, Shelia Eddy, and Skylar Knees were best friends. But on July 6, 2012, Schoaf and Eddie lured an unsuspecting Mies into the woods of Pennsylvania, counted to three, and stabbed her to death. For several months, 
the teenage killers kept their horrific crime a secret. Then, Sho finally broke under the pressure and confessed to the murder, leading the police to where they'd hidden Nise's body. When asked why they killed her, Shof would say it was because we just didn't like her. Born on June 10, 1996, Rachel Shof seemed to have a lot of promise. Described by those who knew her as an adventurous and happy girl, Shof appeared to be thriving by the time she was attending high school in Morgantown, West Virginia. Shof had good grades, took singing and piano lessons, and was involved in theater. She also had two best friends, Shelia Eddy and Skylar Knees, and the girls did everything together. She loved life and there was no reason for her not to. Kelly Kearns Shof's close family friend stated, people around her loved her. Soon, however, Kearns noticed changes in Shof's behavior. The teen started sneaking out, skipping classes, and regularly smoking marijuana. Meanwhile, there appeared to be growing tension in her friendship group with Skylar Knees. In early July 2012, Knees's posts on social media seemed to hint that she was feeling excluded by her friends. It really doesn't take much to piss me off, Knees wrote in one post on X, then known as Twitter, soon after. She wrote, sick of being at home. Thanks friends, love hanging out with you all too. The next day, she wrote, you doing stuff like that is why I will never completely trust you. Chillingly, the following morning, Skylar Knees vanished. Shortly after midnight on July 6, 2012, 16-year-old Skylar Knees snuck out of her home in Star City, West Virginia to meet up with Rachel Schof and Shelia Eddy to smoke marijuana. Later, surveillance footage would show Skylar Knees entering Eddy's vehicle at about 12 35 a.m. Knees was never seen alive again. While Knees had apparently believed this would be a night out with friends like any other, Shof and Eddie had other plans. They had secretly brought along knives, which they'd hidden in their hoodies, as well as cleaning supplies, a shovel, and clean clothes to change into later. The girls smoked weed and drove around, eventually stopping in a remote wooded area just over the state line in Pennsylvania. Once there, Knees turned around to go find a lighter in the car. Then, Shof and Eddie counted, one, two, three, and literally stabbed their friend in the back, attacking her until she was dead. Afterward, the girls tried to bury her. When they found that the ground was too hard to dig into, they covered her body with branches and dirt instead. It would be six months before her remains were finally discovered. Just hours after the murder, Skylar Knees' parents realized she wasn't in her room and reported her missing. At first, police assumed she had run away, and her friends went along with the news that she disappeared. That morning, Shelia Eddy called Skylar Knees' parents and explained that she and Rachel Schof had been with her the night before. She admitted that they had snuck out, picked Knees up around 11 p.m., and then drove around smoking marijuana for a bit before dropping Knees off near her house, just before midnight. Later, security footage would reveal that this timeline was off, as the girls didn't even pick Knees up until well after midnight. Meanwhile, Rachel Schof had decided to go on a last-minute boat ride with her mom and her family friend, Kelly Kearns. When Rachel Schof's mom, Patricia, brought up the news that Rachel's friend Skylar Knees had been reported missing, Rachel's behavior didn't seem too unusual. I mean, she was texting all the time, Kearns later remembered. But you see, so much of that, it didn't really phase us. Then, the day after her best friend supposedly vanished without a trace, Rachel Schof left for a two-week-long church camp. As time went on, it eventually became clear that Rachel Schof and Shelia Eddy knew something about Skylar Knees' disappearance. The FBI even got involved, searching the girls' lockers and confiscating their computers. Still, both Shof and Eddie stuck to their previous story to a T. Their stories were verbatim, the same. No one's story is exactly the same unless it's rehearsed, one police officer said about the girls. Then, in late December 2012, 
Rachel Schoff suffered a nervous breakdown and was briefly admitted to a psychiatric hospital. When she was released in early January 2013, she finally decided to confess, telling police that she and Eddie had planned and executed the murder of Skylar Knees. When asked why they'd done it, she simply said, we just didn't like her. About six months after the disappearance of Skylar Knees, Rachel Schoff led the police to the area where she and Eddie had hidden the body in Pennsylvania. Eventually, authorities were able to recover the remains. By May 2013, police had enough evidence to arrest both Rachel and Shelia. Those who knew Rachel Schoff personally were stunned that she could have committed such a brutal murder. There was never any sign. Not a mean kid, not a bully, didn't torture animals. Kelly Kern said. With all of the potential and morals, I don't even get where this came from. After securing a plea deal, Rachel Schoff readily pleaded guilty to the second-degree murder of Skylar Knees. In February 2014, she was sentenced to 30 years in prison, with the possibility of parole after 10 years. Before her sentencing, she apologized to the Knees family. The person that did that was not the real me. She said, I became scared, caught up in something that I did not want to do. Nise's father did not accept Schof's apologies. Rachel Schof murdered my daughter in cold blood, Dave Nies said in response. She can take her apologies and sit on them. Schof served the first part of her sentence in a juvenile facility, and she was relocated to a state prison after her 18th birthday. Shelia Eddy, meanwhile, was sentenced to life in prison for first-degree murder with the possibility of parole after 15 years. While Rachel Schoff initially claimed she and Shelia Eddy had murdered their friend because they just didn't like her, not everyone was satisfied with that motive. In fact, some theorized that the pair may have had a secret sexual relationship and that they killed Knees because she found out. At her parole hearing in May 2023, Schoff, then 26, confirmed this theory, claiming she and Eddie had been seeing one another, and they were afraid of what would happen if Knees revealed their secret. After things became known with the relationship, there was tension between us, she said. It was hostile and violent. In our teenage minds, we didn't know how to handle the conflict, and we just wanted it to stop. Skylar Nies's family, however, insisted that she would never have outed her friends. She had other gay friends, they said, and wouldn't have been bothered by their relationship. In a statement to the parole board, Nies's father Dave Nies strongly recommended against granting Schof parole. This narcissistic, first-degree, cold-blooded killer is not sorry for the brutal murder of my only child, he wrote in the statement. The date of July 6, 2012 was chosen for a specific reason. You see, this beast wanted the killing out of the way before she left for church camp. Just another task to mark off of her list, like standing over my child saying, die. As my baby girl took her last breath, because the evil butcher didn't want to be her friend. Rachel Schoff was denied parole. She is projected to be released in 2028. On New Year's Day, 1991, fire emergency services were called to a residential fire in Murphy's, California at 2, 26 p.m. They were confronted by Carl Carlson, who said he just rescued his three children from inside the burning home, but that someone else was still inside. He said he wasn't able to get inside to save his wife, Christina. First responders found Christina's body in the bathroom of the rundown house. Carl told officials that the fire may have started because of a utility light that had fallen. Fire officials determined that the origin of the fire was directly outside the bathroom. Christina had been taking a bath while Carl worked in the garage. Officials observed some red flags, according to John Clear, Lieutenant of Investigations, Seneca County Sheriff's Office. The window in the bathroom where Christina died was boarded up. The odor of kerosene was prominent. However, 
Carlson told investigators they couldn't afford to fix the broken pane. He said that they used kerosene to heat the house, and that a container of it had spilled and seeped into the carpet days before the blaze. On its face, it looks like it could be an accident, said Clear. But when someone dies, the default is to consider it suspicious until you know better. The investigators weren't going to just accept that this was an accidental fire based upon Carl Carlson's story, added former state trooper Jeff Arnold. An autopsy was performed the following day, while investigators looked for leads on the cause of the fire. The physician found soot in Christina's lungs, but no evidence indicating she was injured or incapacitated before the blaze. The autopsy determined Christina died from smoke inhalation. It didn't conclude if the death was an accident or a homicide. The day after the fire, Carlson surprised Christina's family and authorities when he announced he was moving with his daughters, Aaron and Katie, and son, Levi, to his hometown in Seneca County, New York. He didn't stay for any funeral services or purchase a headstone. He just packs up and leaves, said Clear. Christina's family was so suspicious, they decided to collect their own evidence. Despite their efforts, on March 3, 1991, Christina's death was officially ruled an accident. There just wasn't enough hard evidence to prove otherwise, said Moreland. State Farm Insurance paid a life insurance policy of approximately $215,000 to Carlson. I've worked with insurance investigators, and if an arrest is not made, insurance policies are not going to deny the claim, explained Clear. Was that payout a motive for murder? Investigators considered that. Carlson moved on and purchased a section of a farm from his parents. About a year later, he married Cindy Best. On November 20, 2008, 17 years after Christina's death, Cindy called 911. She frantically told the dispatcher that their truck had fallen off a jack. Levi, now 23 with a family of his own, was pinned underneath. He wasn't breathing. Officials found that Levi had a crushing compression type of wound to his chest. All indications showed that he had perished hours ago. According to Carlson, Levi was working on the truck when he and Cindy left to go to a funeral. When they returned, he was crushed under the half-ton vehicle. The family doctor signed off on the death as accidental, according to investigators. There was no autopsy done. Christina's mother, Arlene Meltzer, heard the news about Levi. I felt really bad, but I didn't think it was an accident. I thought, it's happened again, she said. In February 2012, Clear received a call from Levi's cousin, Jackie Heimel, who asked if he had investigated Levi's death. She said, there's a good chance he was murdered by his father. Through conversations with Cindy, Heimel had heard things that had raised her suspicions. She talks about the fact that Carl had made money off of Christina's death, and that Christina's children had never seen any of that money, Moreland stated. Carlson had taken out insurance policies on the lives of Christina and Levi shortly before their deaths. He was the beneficiary in both cases. Investigators reopened the case into Levi's death. On April 9, 2012, they called Cindy Carlson, who was estranged from her husband. She agreed to cooperate and was interviewed numerous times over the following months. A profile of Carlson emerged as a controlling and emotionally abusive narcissist. According to Cindy, Carlson and his son had been at odds for quite a while but appeared to be mending fences. Carlson had been the one to convince Levi to get the $700,000 life insurance policy, which was taken out 17 days before Levi's death. Cindy said she didn't find out about it until after Levi was dead. Carl had pretty much blown most of the money on a get-rich-quick scheme, said Clear. Before separating from Carlson, Cindy had a private investigator do some digging on her husband and learned Carlson had taken out an insurance policy on her. Cindy agreed to wear a wire to catch Carlson talking about his son's death. Although he didn't confess, Carlson made an admission that enabled police to bring him in for questioning. Carlson's version of the events before Levi's death were inconsistent. 
He initially said Levi had been crushed before going to his aunt's funeral. Carlson then said he caused the truck to fall, freaked out, and left. I don't believe it for a second that he accidentally dropped the truck on his son, said Clear. But for legal purposes, it doesn't really matter. Under New York state law, that's depraved indifference. That's murder in the second degree. Carlson was arrested for second degree murder and insurance fraud. He pleaded guilty to second degree murder and was sentenced to 15 years. In a stroke of good luck, an investigator in California has preserved copies of all the records related to the death of Christina Carlson. It had been determined that kerosene had been poured on the floor just before the fire was lit. On December 8, 2012, the Calaveras County District Attorney's Office officially reopened the investigation into her death. Carlson's trial for her murder began in 2020, nearly three decades after her death. On February 3, 2020, a jury convicted him of first-degree murder. Carlson was sentenced to life in prison without parole. In 1965, 16-year-old Sylvia Likens was sent to the home of a family friend, Gertrude Banasowski, while her parents were traveling. But Likens never made it out alive. Gertrude Banasowski and her children tortured Sylvia Likens to death. The perpetrators even managed to involve an entire neighborhood of kids to help them commit this brutal murder. As the autopsy in the Sylvia Likens case later showed, she endured unimaginable torment before she died. Nevertheless, her killers faced almost no justice at all. Sylvia Likens' parents were both carnival workers and were therefore on the road more often than not. They struggled to make ends meet as her father Lester had only an eighth grade education and a total of five children to care for. Jenny was quiet and withdrawn with a limp from polio. Sylvia was more confident and went by the nickname Cookie and had been described as pretty though she had a missing front tooth. In July 1965, Lester Likens decided to take up with the carnival again. While his wife was jailed for shoplifting that summer, Sylvia's brothers, Danny and Benny, were put into the care of their grandparents. With few other options, Sylvia and Jenny were sent to stay with a family friend named Gertrude Banasiewski. Gertrude was every bit as poor as the Likens and had seven of her own kids to support in her rundown home. She made little cash by charging her neighbors a few dollars to iron their laundry. She'd already been through multiple divorces, some of which resulted in physical abuse against her and dealt with a crippling depression through heavy doses of prescription drugs. She was in no condition to take care of two teenage girls. The Likens, though, didn't think they had any other choice. Lester Likens cryptically requested that Banasiewski straighten his daughters out when he placed them in her care for $20 a week. For the first two weeks at the Banasiewski's, Sylvia and her sister were treated kindly enough. Though Gertrude's oldest daughter, 17-year-old Paula, seemed to butt heads with Sylvia often. Then one week their father's payment came in late. I took care of you two for two weeks for nothing, Gertrude spat at Sylvia and Jenny. She grabbed Sylvia by the arm, dragged her into a room, and closed the door. Jenny could only sit outside the door and listen as her sister screamed. The money arrived the following day, but the torture had just begun. Gertrude soon began to abuse both Sylvia and Jenny in broad daylight. Though a frail woman, Gertrude used a heavy paddle and thick leather belt from one of her husbands, who had been a cop. When she was too exhausted or too weak to discipline the girls herself, Paula stepped in to take her place. Sylvia, however, soon became the focus of the abuse. Gertrude Banasiewski demanded that Jenny join in, lest she take her sister's place as the brunt of the abuse. Gertrude accused Sylvia of stealing from her and burned the girl's fingertips. She took her to a church function and force-fed her free hot dogs until she was sick. Then, as punishment for throwing up good food, she forced her to eat her own vomit. She allowed her children, in fact, encouraged her children to partake in the abuse of Sylvia and her sister. The Benisuski kids practiced karate on Sylvia, 
slammed her into walls and onto the floor. They used her skin as an ashtray, threw her downstairs and cut open her skin and rubbed salt into her wounds. After this, she would often be cleansed in a scalding hot bath. Gertrude gave sermons on the evils of sexual immortality, while Paula stomped on Sylvia's vagina. Paula, who herself was pregnant, accused Sylvia of being with child and mutilated the girl's genitals. Gertrude's 12-year-old son John Jr. delighted in forcing the girl to lick his youngest sibling's soiled diapers clean. Sylvia was so beaten that she was unable to use the bathroom voluntarily. When she wet her mattress, Gertrude decided that the girl was no longer fit to live with the rest of her children. The 16-year-old was then locked in the basement without food or access to the bathroom. Gertrude spread every story she could imagine to get the local kids to join in on the beatings. She told her daughter that Sylvia had called her a whore and got her daughter's friends to come over and beat her up for it. Later during the trial, some of the kids were open about how Gertrude had recruited them. One teenage girl named Anna Sisko recalled how Gertrude told her that Sylvia had been saying, she said my mother went out with all sorts of men and got five dollars for going to bed with the men. Anna never bothered to find out if it was true. Gertrude told her, I don't care what you do to Sylvia. She invited over to her home and just watched as Anna threw Sylvia down to the ground, beat her face, and kick her. Gertrude told her own children that Sylvia was a prostitute. Then she had Ricky Hobbs, a neighborhood boy, and her 11-year-old daughter Marie carved the words, I'm a prostitute, and proud of it into her abdomen with a heated needle. At one point, Sylvia's older sister Diana attempted to see the girls under Gertrude's care, but was turned away at the door. Jenny later reported how Diana snuck food into the basement in which Sylvia was hidden. A neighbor had also reported the incidents to a public health nurse, who, upon entering the home, and not seeing Sylvia for she was locked in a basement, concluded that nothing was wrong. Benisiewski had also managed to convince the nurse that she had kicked the Lycans girls out. Other next-door neighbors allegedly were aware of how Sylvia was abused. They had seen Paula strike the girl in the Benisiewski home on two separate occasions, but claimed not to report the abuse because they feared for their own lives. Jenny was threatened, bullied, and beaten by the Banasiewskis and neighbor girls alike should she go to the authorities. The abuse of Sylvia continued unhindered, in fact, aided by all those around her. I'm going to die, Sylvia told her sister three days before she did. I can tell. Gertrude could tell too, and so she forced Sylvia to write a note in which she told her parents that she'd run away. Sylvia was also forced to write that she'd met up with a group of boys and given them sexual favors, and afterward, they'd beaten her and mutilated her body. Shortly after this, Sylvia overheard Gertrude Banasiewski tell her children that she was going to take Sylvia to a forest and leave her there to die. A desperate Sylvia Likens attempted one final escape. She managed to get out the front door before Gertrude caught her. Sylvia was so weak from her injuries she could not have possibly gotten too far. With the assistance of a neighbor boy named Coy Hubbard, Gertrude beat Sylvia with a curtain rod until she fell unconscious. Then, when she came back to, she stomped on her head. Sylvia was dead by October 26, 1965, from a brain hemorrhage, shock, and malnutrition. After three months of torture and starvation, she could no longer form intelligible words and could barely move her limbs. When the police came, Gertrude stuck with her cover story. Sylvia had been out with boys in the woods, she told them, and they'd beaten her to death and carved I am a prostitute and proud of it into her body. Jenny, though, took her chance. As soon as she could get close enough to a police officer, she whispered, get me out of here and I'll tell you everything. The police arrested Gertrude, Paula, Stephanie, and John Banasiewski, Richard Hobbs, and Coy Hubbard for murder. Neighborhood participants Mike Monroe, Randy Lepper, Darlene McGuire, Judy Duke, and Anna Sisko were also arrested for injury to person, 
These miners would blame Gertrude for being pressured to partake in the slaughter of Sylvia Likens. Gertrude herself pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. She's not responsible, her defense attorney told the court, because she's not all here. There were several more children involved who proved just too young to be charged. Ultimately, though, on May 19, 1966, Gertrude Benesiewski was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. She was spared the death penalty despite her own lawyer admitting that, in my opinion, she ought to go to the electric chair. Paula Benesiewski, who had given birth to a daughter during the trial, was convicted of second-degree murder and was also sentenced to life imprisonment. Richard Hobbs, Coy Hubbard, and John Benesowski Jr. were all convicted of manslaughter and given two 2 to 21 year prison sentences based on the fact that they were minors. The three boys were all paroled just two years later in 1968. Gertrude spent 20 years behind bars. There was no question about her guilt. The autopsy backed up everything Jenny told the police. Sylvia Likens had died slowly and painfully over several months. In 1971, both Gertrude and Paula were retried to the result that Gertrude was again found guilty. Paula pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of voluntary manslaughter and was sentenced to 2 to 21 years. She once even managed to escape despite being recaptured. After about eight years behind bars, Paula was released and she moved to Iowa, where she changed her name and became a teacher's aide. She was suspended from her position when in 2012, an anonymous caller tipped off the school district that Paula was once convicted of the death of 16-year-old Sylvia Likens. Gertrude Banasiewski was granted parole on good behavior on December 4, 1985. Jenny and a whole crowd of people picketed outside the prison to protest her release, but it was no use. Gertrude Banasiewski was set free. The only relief Jenny received came five years after Gertrude's release, when the murderess died of lung cancer. Some good news, Jenny wrote to her mother with a copy of the woman's obituary. Damn old Gertrude died. Ha ha ha. I am happy about that. Jenny never did blame her parents for what happened to her sister. My mom was a really good mom, Jenny has said. All she did was trust Gertrude. Anu Singh was a promising law student, living in a Canberra townhouse with her loving boyfriend Joe Singhwe, when she invited friends over for a dinner party, unlike any other. It was 1997, and before friends arrived, she issued them with a chilling warning. A crime was going to be committed. None of the guests that night took the threat seriously. But before the night was out, Sink was unconscious. He had consumed a cup of coffee Singe had spiked with a date rape drug before injecting him with a large dose of heroin. She waited 36 hours before calling paramedics, by which time Sinkwe could not be revived. When Joe Sink met Anu Singe on a night out in Newcastle in 1995, the handsome young engineer was immediately taken by the 22-year-old graduate. Singh eventually moved to Canberra to commence a law degree at the Australian National University, and the couple went long distance, with Singh traveling from Newcastle every weekend to be with his girlfriend. And while Singhwa was, by all reports, smitten by Singh, his increasingly frequent visits seemed to be spurred on by concern for his girlfriend's well-being. Maria and Nino Cinque, Joe's parents, noticed the change in their son and worried his love interest was too unstable for their boy. In Helen Garner's book, Joe Cinque's Consolation, she reports a conversation in which Maria warned her son not to let Singe control him with her constant demands. He pleaded with his mother not to make him choose between them, telling her I love you, but she needs me. Eventually, Sinkwe made the move to Canberra as well, so he could live with Singe full time. And while friends say the couple appeared happy at times, Singe's mental state continued to decline. Anu Singe was plagued by stomach issues, 
though doctors and specialists were unable to find a cause. She was experimenting with amphetamines, and perhaps as a result of this, would frequently spiral into paranoia, believing things were crawling under her skin. She had dissociative symptoms. She once told her mother she felt as though her head was sitting on top of someone else's body. She was also obsessed with her physical appearance and had developed bulimia, spending hours in the gym and experimenting with various purging techniques, including the use of EPCAC, a vomit-inducing drug. It was this last point that formed the basis of one of the motives put forward by prosecutors at her murder trial. Singh believed the IPCAC had caused her physical ailments and blamed Sinkwe for being the one who told her about it in a passing conversation. Another time, according to episode 130 of True Crime Podcast Case File, Singe became convinced she had contracted HIV and told a friend it was unfair that Sinkwe was unaffected by her disease. She said she planned to put a drop of her infected blood on his toothbrush. She also told another friend that she wanted to go on a rampage, killing Sinkwe, her ex-boyfriend Simon, and all the doctors who she believed had failed to correctly diagnose her. She told the friend, I've studied psychiatric texts, and it wouldn't be too hard to convince someone that you're insane. During the months of September and October in 1997, Sinch spoke to several friends and acquaintances about wanting to end her own life. After initially deciding to shoot herself, she changed her mind after a conversation with a known drug user on campus about heroin overdose. She purchased half a gram of heroin and was shown how to shoot up. After this, she returned to purchase another gram. When the drug dealer asked why she needed so much, Singh replied, someone's coming with me. This second dinner party unfolded along much the same lines. Unbelievably, with several of the student guests being aware that Singh was planning some sort of suicide pact, but failing to try to intervene and seek help. Multiple guests later testified they hadn't really thought she was serious about her intentions. After all the guests went home, Singh crushed up several Rohypnol pills, a known date rape drug, and slipped them into Sinkwe's coffee. Over the next 36 hours, she injected him several times with heroin, at one stage, leaving to buy more and returning to shoot up her unconscious boyfriend again, before eventually calling paramedics. When she finally did call emergency services, she refused to give them the correct address. In the intervening day and a half between Singh's dinner party and paramedics being called, she made several phone calls to friends about what she was doing. She told them Sinkwe was vomiting blood, taking one breath every 10 seconds, and that his lips had turned blue. Once paramedics arrived, it was too late. Sinkwe couldn't be revived. Anu Singh stood trial for murder, but was eventually convicted of the lesser charge of manslaughter because of diminished responsibility as a result of her mental illness at the time of Sink's death. She served just four years of her 10-year sentence, using her time behind bars to complete a master's in criminology. She has since written a thesis on female offenders and the causes behind their crimes, which she published a condensed version of as an e-book entitled Offending Women. The internet is known as a breeding ground for illicit affairs between people often hiding behind fake names and handles. But most such virtual relationships aren't dangerous as this. When tall, hot, blonde, and marine sniper struck up a relationship online, it ended in murder. Maureen sniper was 46-year-old Thomas Montgomery, a married father of two. In May 2005, posing as a young, handsome, Iraq-bound Marine, he entered a teen chat room, the popular game site Pogo. When 18-year-old tall, hot blonde started instant messaging him, he decided to pretend he was 18 too. She said she was an attractive 18-year-old woman eager to meet men, even if they were far from her West Virginia home. I kept thinking, well, we're never going to meet. I'll just play the game with her, he said. Before long, the flirtation became a romance. In reality, Thomas Montgomery, 
who had spent the last 12 years working at a factory in this suburb of Buffalo. His cyber lover from West Virginia was also in her 40s, the police say, but had adopted her daughter's identity, including the younger woman's email address and web page, as her online persona. Still, no one would have been hurt had the real world not collided with the pair's middle-aged fantasies. Instead, a 22-year-old co-worker of Mr. Montgomery's was shot dead one September night as he left the power tool plant where they were employed. Mr. Montgomery was arrested in November and charged with second-degree murder. The uniqueness of this case is that everybody appeared to be misleading everybody else, and the whole situation which resulted in a violent death was unnecessary, said John DeFranks, Erie County's first deputy district attorney. Ironically, the only person telling the truth here was the victim. The killing of Brian Barrett, the part-time factory worker who was a student at nearby Buffalo State College and an aspiring teacher, stunned the rural town of Lockport, where he had lived with his parents. He was kind of an easygoing, quiet kid, said Tom Sarkovics. The athletic director and Mr. Barrett's baseball coach at Star Point High School in Pendleton. Outside Lockport, he'd do anything you asked him to do, never complained about running, never complained about drills. According to the police, the men's colleagues at the tool plant, Dynabraid, said that Mr. Montgomery frequently bragged of his online relationship with the supposed teenager from the time it began in May 2005. Then in spring, Mr. Barrett also was drawn into corresponding with the woman. Neither man made any secret of the situation. It was noted by fellow employees that there was a rivalry between the two over what they believed to be the same woman. For an extended period of time, said Dennis Rankin, chief of the patrol services division at the Erie County Sheriff's Department. Mr. Barrett's involvement sprang from a dose of reality, Mr. DeFrank said. For one thing, Mr. Montgomery's wife found an email message from the woman, whose name the police have not released, and wrote to her, revealing that he was not the recent Iraq veteran he claimed to be. In addition, Mr. DeFrank said, Mr. Montgomery had told the woman that he had a friend named Brian, and she was able to contact him. This woman took it upon herself to locate the person online and started chatting with him, he added. Unlike the other two points in the triangle, Mr. Barrett did not feel the need to create a fictitious identity. She flirted online with Barrett, who called himself Beefcake, on open forums for Montgomery to see. With both men believing that she was the gorgeous young thing in her profile pictures and keepsakes sent to them. The pair engaged in a furious rivalry. Brian will pay in blood, wrote Montgomery at one point to Jesse. As the messages he sent to Jesse became increasingly unhinged, Montgomery was embarrassed online by Barrett and Sheeler as they posted his real age and picture onto forums, making him out to be a pedophile. Eventually, Barrett decided to visit Jesse, even though Sheeler had warned him not to. Late on September 15, after finishing his work shift, Mr. Barrett was sitting in his car when he was shot with a 30 caliber weapon in what Chief Rankin described as a sniper shooting. As police responded to the murder, they quickly uncovered the internet love triangle, and when they couldn't find Montgomery, rushed to Jesse. After learning of the connection between Mr. Montgomery, Mr. Barrett, and the woman in West Virginia, investigators searched the computers of all three and compiled hundreds of pages of correspondence. Mr. DeFrank said, Much of it of an adult nature, as well as threats made by Montgomery, toward both Barrett and the woman. However, when police arrived at her door, they were presented with 45-year-old Mary Sheeler telling her what had happened and how they desperately needed to speak to Jesse. Sheeler broke down in a wail of tears and confessed her whole elaborate deception of Montgomery and Barrett. Upon questioning her, they discovered that Jesse was in fact her daughter, and the pictures and underwear she had been sending belonged to her 18-year-old. It was later discovered that Sheeler had flirted online, as Jesse with other men too. 
and once pointed a video camera up her unaware daughter's skirt for a video. She sent to several men with the question, Guys, do you like it? Mr. Montgomery, a stocky man with a swirl of dark blonde hair and a bushy mustache, pleaded not guilty at his arraignment before State Supreme Court Justice Amy Fricano, who ordered him held without bail pending a hearing and warned him not to contact the woman. In the hundreds of messages exchanged, there was no indication that either man planned to meet the woman, leaving investigators struggling to understand why someone would kill over a relationship that existed only in cyberspace. The woman in West Virginia, whose true age became known to Mr. Montgomery only after his arrest, does not face any charges. She was doing absolutely nothing wrong, Chief Rankin said. She obviously didn't realize what was going to happen, or that there would be a love triangle. He added, Mr. Barrett was a completely innocent person who was, from all appearances, a fine, upstanding young man who was putting himself through college. He was simply looking for a friendship on the internet and ended up dying for it. Montgomery seemed to be losing touch with reality. He wrote a note to himself on January 2, 2006, Tom Montgomery, 46 years old, ceases to exist and is replaced by an 18-year-old battle-scarred Marine. He is moving to West Virginia to be with the love of his life. Jessie had no knowledge of her mother's cyber life. Montgomery pleaded guilty to Barrett's murder and was sentenced to 20 years. Prosecutors in New York desperately searched for a reason to charge Mary Sheeler, but ultimately could find no law she had broken. In her defense, she claimed that she was keeping Montgomery online so that he couldn't talk to other teenagers. Sheeler has never apologized to her daughter and her husband divorced her and Jesse cut off contact. Barrett's parents began a petition for laws to protect against future Mary Sheelers. A young woman brutally shot in the apartment of a war hero. Detectives were sure he was on the run, but when they found him, an entirely different story emerged. On May 22, 2010, police responded to a father's frantic 911 call. Steve Herr alerted them that he'd found a woman's body in his son Sam's apartment. Detectives identified the victim as Julie Kibushi. Police initially suspected Sam Herr. Four days later, detectives arrested local actor Daniel Wozniak and charged him as an accessory to murder. Wozniak told them he had helped Sam escape. But after hours of questioning, Wozniak admitted that he had killed Sam Herr. Money was his motive. He wanted to pay for his honeymoon. Wozniak also confessed he had lured Julie to Sam's apartment, killed her, and staged the scene to frame Sam. Wozniak filled a backpack with evidence. Police recovered it just outside his parents' house. The backpack contained Sam Hare's clothes, phone, and wallet. Detectives found that prior to the murders, Wozniak conducted Google searches, how to hide a body, and quick ways to kill people. Wozniak told police he dismembered Sam Hare's body with an ax and saw. Police found Sam Hare's torso in the Liberty Theater at the Los Alamitos Joint Forces training base, where Wozniak had previously performed. It took two days to find Sam Hare's missing body parts. On May 29, Sam's birthday, Steve Hare learned his son's head was found in El Dorado Park. Sam Hare received a hero's burial with full military honors. In November 2012, Wozniak's fiance E, Rachel Buffet was arrested. She was charged as an accessory after the fact to murder. In February 2013, Rachel Buffett went on the Dr. Phil show. She maintained her innocence and stated she had been duped by Dan. Five and a half years after the double murders, Daniel Wozniak went on trial and was convicted. Prosecutor Matt Murphy argued Daniel Wozniak should get the death penalty. He pointed to the killer's lack of remorse, disregard for his victims and their families' suffering. On January 11, 2016, the jury recommended death for Wozniak. In September 2016, the parent of Sam Herr, 
and Julie Kibuishi got to confront Daniel Wozniak in court. A judge pronounced the sentence. It is the order of this court that you shall suffer the death penalty. Wozniak is currently at San Quentin State Prison. Sheila Davalu was born on May 11, 1969, in Iran. Her family emigrated to the United States in the mid-1970s. Sheila attended Sunny Stony Brook and earned a biochemistry degree. She landed a well-paying medical research job straight out of college. She had an affair, and neither her husband nor her boyfriend knew the other existed. She even murdered her boyfriend's girlfriend and almost got away with it. She married her first husband, Farid Mosavi, who filed for divorce when he learned she was carrying an affair with Paul Christos, whom she met while she was attending graduate school at New York Medical College in Valhalla, New York. After getting her degree, Sheila took a job at Purdue Pharma in Stanford, Connecticut as a research scientist. Davalu and her family immigrated to the United States in the late 1970s to escape the chaos and violence of the Iranian Revolution. She and her parents, medical and health professionals, landed safely in their new country and settled into the New York suburb of Yorktown Heights. Like her mom and dad, Davalu was a gifted student, but bowing to family tradition. She was married just out of high school. After college, Davalu attended graduate school at New York Medical College. There, she met a fellow student named Paul Christos, and they began having an affair. When her husband, Farid Masavi, found out about it, he and Sheila divorced. Despite the scandal, Paul and Sheila stayed together, and they were married in 2000. They moved to Pleasantville, New York, the following year. Located just north of New York City in suburban Westchester County, it was a convenient commuting distance from both their jobs. Paul worked for Cornell University at its New York City campus, while Sheila landed a job as a research scientist at Purdue Pharma, located in Stamford, Connecticut. Though things were going well for the couple, the heat of their once passionate affair grew cooler with each domestic accomplishment. In the summer of 2001, Davalu met co-worker Nelson Sessler at a happy hour get-together after work. They soon began a sexual relationship, according to court documents. Sessler, however, had no idea the woman he was sleeping with was married. In order to cover up her affair, Davalu concocted a complicated subterfuge, fooling both husband and lover. To get rid of Christos for the night or weekend, Davalu told him her mentally ill brother was visiting and would become upset if he knew she was married. Christos actually helped his cheating wife remove any trace of his existence from their home, packing up clothes, toiletries, and photographs before going off to spend the night at his parents or one of his friend's houses. He believed she was separated. Divorced, former Westchester County Police Detective Allison Carpentier told a previous episode of Snapped. Paul, literally, did that good of a job moving things out, or Sheila would do that good of a job at hiding things? Davalu was not the only one with multiple romantic interests. At the same time as she was seeing Sessler, he was dating another co-worker at Purdue Pharma named Anna Lisa Raimundo. Eventually, he would break things off with Davalu and move into Raimundo's Stamford apartment. Davalu seemed to take it in stride, telling Sessler their relationship was just a summer fling. Privately, however, Davalu obsessed over Sessler and plotted to eliminate Raimundo. Among those she consulted about the relationship was her own husband. Christos testified that Davalu spoke to him daily about a love triangle at work between her friends Melissa, Annalisa, and Jack. She would constantly ask me why Jack would do this, what he was thinking and what Melissa should do, Christos said. According to reports, Davalu told Christos she spied on Annalisa and Jack with Melissa and wanted to break into her apartment to look at photos. On the morning of November 8, 2002, Davalu made her move. She entered Raimundo's apartment and stabbed her multiple times on the face, neck, and chest. One puncture wound reaching the back of her lung, according to the Stanford Advocate. 
Raimundo also suffered blunt force trauma to her head. To throw authorities off her trail, Davalu called 911 with a fake description of a male assailant. I think a guy is attacking my neighbor. She can be heard saying on recordings of the call, obtained by Snap. I don't know her name, but she's my neighbor, and she lives in 105. I saw a guy go into her apartment. Davalu didn't identify herself and hung up after fumbling Raimundo's address. The 911 dispatcher called back and discovered the call had come from a payphone at a restaurant near the crime scene, according to court documents. The restaurant's manager couldn't recall seeing anyone at the payphone. Responding to the 911 call, authorities converged on Raimundo's apartment. They opened the door and they walked in on a horrific, violent assault scene. Stamford Police Captain Richard Conklin told Snapped in 2012. The walkway from the front door was a bloody mess. Things thrown about and knocked about. The apartment showed no signs of forced entry or a robbery. Conklin said crime scene technicians carefully swabbed up blood, believing the perpetrator's DNA might be present. A drop of blood was lifted from the bathroom sink, which detectives believed the killer used to wash up after the attack. Christos would later recall Davalu had a deep cut on her hand around the time of the murder. She claimed it came from opening a can of dog food. Sessler arrived at the apartment later that afternoon, completely unaware of what had happened. He responded calmly when informed of Raimundo's death, which raised the suspicions of investigators. He was brought in for questioning but Sessler was cleared the following day when Stamford police reviewed security records from Purdue Pharma. They have very good security cameras, security system, and they were able to show what time he punched in, Conklin told Snapped. He was at work when this assault took place. Following up on Davalu's bogus tip, authorities searched for a male suspect to no avail. They also sought out the 911 caller, who had claimed to be one of Raimundo's neighbors. We canvass all the neighbors, but no neighbor in that area matches that voice," Conklin said. While police chased dead ends and phony leads, Davalu used the occasion to renew her relationship with Sessler. She consoled him in his time of grief, and by January 2003, they were sleeping together again, according to court documents. Davalu even used the same visiting brother Ruse to send Christos away when Sessler was coming over to spend the night. With her rival for Sessler's affections out of the way, it was now time for Davalu to get rid of her husband. It was a Saturday afternoon on March 22, 2003, when she suggested to Christos that they play a bedroom game to spice up their failing marriage. Under the guise of bringing more intimacy back into the marriage, Sheila Davalu asked her husband to play a kinky game. Blindfolded and handcuffed to a kitchen chair, each person takes turns trying to guess what object is being placed on their skin. Sheila has guessed all of her turns correctly, and then it was her husband's turn to be blindfolded. I heard her go down to the kitchen, and when she came up, she said, There is one last item. One last thing to guess Christos later testified. I felt her sit on me. Then I felt a thrust like a heavy weight was on my chest. And then another thrust. Davalu had stabbed him twice in the chest with a paring knife. Christos begged her to call 911, but his wife stalled for time, hoping he would bleed to death. Instead of calling emergency dispatch, she phoned Sessler and asked him to come over for dinner that night. After almost an hour had passed, she agreed to drive Christos to Westchester Medical Center. In the parking lot, she stabbed him a third time, nicking his heart According to the Stamford Advocate, Christos managed to escape and a group of bystanders who witnessed the attack called police. Christos survived following open heart surgery and Davalu was arrested for attempted murder. Detectives in Westchester drove to Stamford to talk to Sessler after seeing Davalu had called him in between stabbing her husband. Learning his girlfriend had recently been killed, they spoke with detectives working the Ray Mundo murder and discovered the two cases were connected. When we heard the 911 tape, I said to them, You know, that's Sheila Davalu's voice. Carpentier told, snapped.
In 2004, Devalu was found guilty of attempted murder and assault for the stabbing of her then-husband Christos. She was sentenced to the maximum of 25 years in prison without the possibility of parole. After slowly and methodically building the case against her, authorities in Connecticut arrested Davalu in prison for the murder of Raimundo. The prosecution rested on two damning pieces of evidence. Davalu's voice on the 911 call on the afternoon of the murder, and the blood sample taken from the bathroom sink, which came back as a match to Davalu. She was ultimately found guilty of Raimundo's murder and sentenced to 50 years in prison. Upon completing her 25-year sentence at New York's Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women, she will be transferred to a Connecticut prison to begin her 50-year sentence. On July 23, 2007, Jennifer Hawk Petit entered a bank in the quiet town of Cheshire, Connecticut, and asked to withdraw $15,000 from her account. She told the shocked bank teller that she needed the money because her husband and two daughters were being held hostage and that her family wouldn't be harmed if she gave their captors the cash. Tragically, the hostage situation would soon escalate into the bloodbath now known as the Cheshire Murders. Until that point, the town of Cheshire struck many as the kind of place where nothing bad ever happened. Jennifer and her family, her husband, William Petit, and daughters Haley, 17, and Michaela, 11, had lived a normal suburban life, but the town's sense of calm was shattered that July. Then, in the dead of night, two burglars snuck into the family's quaint Cheshire home. Though they initially planned to merely rob the place, the home invasion soon escalated into all-out violence, leaving most of the petite family dead and their house in flames. This is the harrowing story of the 2007 Cheshire murders. The Petit family was a fairly normal one. William was an endocrinologist. Jennifer was a nurse. Their 17-year-old daughter, Haley, was preparing to go Dartmouth in the fall, and their 11-year-old daughter, Michaela, had a budding passion for cooking. The Petits were middle class and lived in a simple two-story home at 300 Sorghum Mill Drive, but the perpetrators of the Cheshire murders came from more checkered backgrounds. Joshua Komisarjevsky, the younger of the two burglars, came from money but had had a difficult childhood. Adopted and diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder at a young age, Komisarjevsky was both a victim and a perpetrator of abuse among his adopted siblings. Komisarjevsky's highly religious parents refused to seek treatment for him, and they blamed a satanic cult for his eventual spiral into crime. Komisarjevsky began breaking into houses and using drugs, which led him to meet his accomplice in the Cheshire murders, Linda Hayes. Linda Hayes, born Stephen Hayes, changed their name in prison following the Cheshire murders, though according to the New York Times they didn't specify what pronouns they use. In many ways, Hayes' childhood was similar to Komisarjevsky's. Hayes had also been abused as a child, and had turned to petty theft to support a drug habit. Hayes met Komisarjevsky at a halfway house in 2006, and the two became friendly. About a year later, Komisarjevsky and Hayes' world would violently collide with the Petit families. Joshua Komisarjevsky and Linda Hayes' decision to break into the Petit home was not random. On July 22, 2007, the day before the Cheshire murders, Komisar Jevsky spotted Jennifer Hawk Petit and her daughter Michaela at the local stop and shop. He followed the pair home and was impressed by their house. I started thinking it's a very nice house and a very nice car and thought it would be nice to be there someday, Komisar Jevsky told police in his confession, not have to worry about financial problems and stress. Komisar Jevsky enlisted Hay's help and, at around 3 a.m. the next morning, the pair broke into the Petit's home. They found William Petit asleep in the sunroom, where he had fallen asleep reading the paper. Komisarjevsky grabbed a baseball bat nearby and started to pummel Petit with it. 
they tied up Petite in the basement, then went upstairs, where they found Haley in her room and Michaela with her mother, where she'd fallen asleep while reading Harry Potter. Komisar Jevsky and Hayes put pillowcases over Jennifer, Michaela, and Haley's heads and tied them to their beds before setting out to search the house. When Komisar Jevsky and Hayes found fewer valuables than they'd expected, they changed their plans. They grabbed Jennifer and demanded that she drive to the bank with Hayes to withdraw money. At the Bank of America branch in Cheshire, Hayes waited in the car while Jennifer entered the bank to withdraw $15,000. According to Mary Lyons, the branch manager, Jennifer, seemed petrified. She explained to me that her family was being held, and as long as she got the money and got back to the house, everybody would be okay. Lyons recounted ten years later. I just knew from the look on her face and the look in her eyes that she was telling the truth. Her eyes told me, a look from one mom to another mom. Lyons approved the withdrawal and called the police as soon as Jennifer and her captor drove away. Sadly, Jennifer Hawk Petit and her daughters would never be seen alive again. After the bank called the authorities, the police sent units to the Petit home. But they were instructed not to enter yet, even though a hostage negotiator was on hand and ready to intervene. And as police awaited further instruction, the situation inside 300 Sorghum Mill Drive was rapidly escalating. While Hayes and Jennifer were gone, Komisar Jevsky had sexually assaulted 11-year-old Michaela. Then, when Hayes and Jennifer got back to the house, Komisar Jevsky instructed Hayes to rape Jennifer to square things up. And Hayes did. As the police stood in position outside, several things happened almost at once. First, William managed to escape from the basement. Bloodied and bound, he shot out of the house, yelling for help. Hayes then strangled Jennifer, killing her. And in the burglar's final act of cruelty, they poured gasoline throughout the house and over Haley and Michaela before igniting it with a match. As fire engulfed the Petit's house, the duo jumped into the Petit family's car and tried to escape. They almost immediately crashed into a police cruiser and were promptly arrested. It was just after 10 a.m., the Cheshire murders had been going on for seven brutal hours. In the horrific aftermath of the Cheshire murders, Jennifer Hawk Petit, Haley Petit, and Michaela Petit all lay dead. Jennifer had been strangled to death, while both Haley and Michaela suffered intense burns and died of smoke inhalation. Komisar Jevsky and Hayes, who were tried separately, accused the other of lighting the final, fatal match and were both sentenced to death. However, Connecticut has since abolished capital punishment. They'll instead spend the rest of their lives in prison. As for William Petit, the only survivor of the Cheshire murders, in the wake of the gruesome crime, he's been forced to create a new life for himself. Petit started a foundation in his loved one's honor, and it's through this organization that he met his second wife, Christine Polliff. The two now have a young son. If you enjoyed the video, please show your support by subscribing and liking the video. And turn on all notifications so you don't miss any future uploads.